How's it going, everybody? Welcome into yet another episode of Debate Night. We got a bunch of fun topics here. Just had a major this past weekend and some great analysts as well. So let's introduce them. First off, we've got Mr. Brody Smith. It was tough, man. Man of the people going back, reading the comments. Oh, um, <laughs> it's brutal. It's it's almost like it's almost like I'm one of the most unselfish people in disc golf where I'm willing to let my ego and pride go and try to make the best product possible out there. I try to warn people. I said, stop reading off a script. No one likes it. No one listened. And here we are. Um, it is what it is. I saw it coming. I try to warn everyone. Try to warn. It's not, this show's not about winning. It's about entertainment, folks. Brody, Brody Smith, humble disc golf man. Uh, Michelle is joining us as well. Yeah, so excited to be back. And um, yeah, all the way from Sweden. Once again, middle of the night. <laughs> Absolutely. The commitment is there. And then uh, Dustin's back. It's been a while since we've had Dustin, our, our champion from last year. I was indeed the 2022 champ, but much like the field has gotten better in disc golf, so has debate night. So uh, I don't think I'm going to be having that type of performance in 2024. Okay. Humble Dustin coming I'm in. Just, just a, lot of humble, a lot of that humble cast like members. A shot at all the cast members, though, from last year. Ooh, I was just saying trash. you can count the wins and you can count my finals appearances and you make your own conclusions. All right. Okay. Ooh, okay. <laughs> and then uh, Gary is is joining us as well, and he's been on a bit of a tear on the show as of as of late. Uh, super happy to be back. I caught some flack last week. One of my friends was like, "Hey, Brody was like Gondor calling for aid in Lord of the Rings, and you yeah, just got there and let him burn." <laughs> so, uh, so my my promise to all of you out there is that some point in time during this episode. I am going to just back Brody 100%. No matter it what. It could be early. It could be late. You got to stay for the whole thing to see when it happens. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Gary is there when you need him. Uh, well, without further ado, let's get into our first topic of the night. Um, so we just had our major, the Champions Cup at Northwood. I'm going to call it Northwood Park because we kept calling it Northwood Black and everybody was giving us a lot of flack for that. So Northwood Park, the host of this year's Champions Cup, is widely known as one of the toughest courses on tour. Did you find that it was a suitable event for a or suitable venue for a four round major? Do you like the golf it produced? And should the event stay there permanently? Brody Smith, what do you think? Well, first, the conspiracy theory around the the name and them actually changing the course is so that they can actually play Northwood Black at Ledgestone. Mm. Uh, you can't play the same course if you ho if you hold a major, but technically, how many holes need to change for it to not to be the same course? So, I'll throw that okay. out there. Good point. Um, I think this was much better. Uh, this I thought this was a much better test than um, WR Jackson. I love WR Jackson. I think it is a great course, but I think this has a, a way different mental battle, which I think should kind of be involved with majors as far as game plan, strategy, course management, all those things come into play. WR Jackson, there are a lot of holes out there um, that you can kind of just chuck rollers around if, if to, to try to get out of scrambling. Um, if you throw a bad shot, you can still kind of work your way to get a birdie or a par. The way that the course is set up at Northwood, it's very, very challenging if you throw a bad shot or you hit a tree early to even to even save par and sometimes to even save bogey. Um, so we really saw people actually have to play disc golf out there, what I like to see in the woods. Uh, the one thing I would say, I would love it to hold there permanently. The one thing I would like to see it, them change is maybe if we are doing four rounds out there, maybe change a couple tee pads, maybe change a couple pin locations. So for example, hole one, you can move us down. So we're not so high up, move us down, move the pin 30 feet to the right. And now that hole is a forehand. And I would like to see that mixed up a little bit. Okay. All right. So Brody liking the Northwood track, uh, Michelle, what did you think? Yeah. So I mostly watched FPO uh, and for the FPO, I think the course is really good for a major. Uh, I think that it really takes some really good shots some placements, some golf, like Brody said. And for the FBO, I don't think it's too hard. Uh, I think it works perfectly when it's meant to be like a tight wooded course. Um, I also think that the holes made sense and there's a lot of scoring separation. And if you play good, you climb a lot, which is fun to see. Uh, for the FPO or for the MPO, like watching MPO after FPO, I felt like the holes were so long <laughs> and looking at it, it felt like it was impossible. Um, so I think for the MPO, I think it was a little too hard watching it because uh, it was super punishable if you really caught an early tree. Um, 
but I think it's fun having two courses uh, on a major, but I also like the idea that the majors play at the same course all four rounds because it really shows that you have to play really good for all four consecutive rounds. Um, I also think that it's so much fun not having those high double digits under par every round. Uh, it also creates the openness that if you play good, you can climb the climb the spot and actually get into a leaderboard, get into a lead card, get some action in there. Um, so yeah, I really liked it. Yeah, it definitely facilitates the the effect of players being able to really charge up the leaderboard and fall very quick. And we saw that a ton. Yeah. Um, Dustin, what did you think? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think when it comes to majors, I prefer balance. So I prefer either a course that provides a mixture of open shots and a mixture of more technical shots, whether that be due to being a wooded hole that requires you to hit a gap and stay in a fairway, whether that be due to like having to hit certain landing zones, avoiding OB, things of that nature. I like the full array of skill kind of being challenged throughout the course of a major, either throughout that one course, if you are going to use one course, or like a situation like GMC where you're splitting it up between Fox Run and Brewster Ridge. And so you're still kind of getting a dichotomy of more open golf, more wooded technical golf, kind of all on the same course. However, I don't mind the idea of let's say having certain majors that are that way, maybe one major that is more of an open golf style and then a major like this, it is a more wooded golf style. And I do think that Northwood does provide that wooded golf challenge. If you are going to have a wooded golf major, I agree with Brody. I think it's more challenging than WR Jackson. It's more punishing. It's more technical. Um, I do think though that I, to me, it's not enough just to change some holes and still keep this course for Ledgestone if it's going to be a major going forward. Like, I do think that you're going to have to make a more drastic change to Ledgestone to better separate Northwood from, you know, that that situation. So that's kind of an issue I have. Another issue I kind of have going forward using Northwood is that whole situation with the danger of falling limbs and having to have, like, red, like, drop zones that you are mandatorily have to stay away from. I think that could cause some issues with safety and just how the golf gets played. Live coverage is always going to be a situation. If you have grainy video out there, that's a problem. Same with live viewership. So, yeah, that, that's kind of my take. Yeah, that's that's a perspective I know a lot of people have with like kind of the perfectionist major thing where we want to have the best balance instead of really specializing, of course. Um, Gary, has anyone died from bark? No. Bark. What the heck okay. are you talking about? I think they were concerned about like bigger there was, limbs falling on people. There, there was like a thirty-pound piece of bark that fell from a tree like ten feet in front of me when I was putting, and I was oh. just questioning like, if it was thirty feet, would then. that have would that have killed me? If it's that Man. much weight from that high up and it hit you in the right place, yes, hundred percent. Yeah, probably. Yeah. That's Brody what is hundred percent right here. Totally worth <laughs> There he is. There he is. <laughs> he almost died. Died by bark. Almost. Mm. Yeah, that, that would suck. Worse man. than his bite. <laughs> yeah. All right, Gary, what were your thoughts? I, I think as a major course, Northwood Park works, or at least the idea of Northwood Park works. There's some definite pros there. It creates a different kind of golf. The difficulty means I think a lot of different people can win. And um, sometimes that golf is a little consistent and to some people could be a little bit boring, but it, it worked for Presno. I mean, only nine bogeys and no double bogeys or worse across the course of the, the weekend. And he posted on social media that he didn't try to take any hero shots at all, where you have Ezra on the same card trying to throw the plastic off of his disc and ending up in, this, in the, the rough having to scrape everywhere you know northwood park is all about being clean and getting to the green and and limiting the problems i did a little stat analysis where i went back to every single event this year and i looked at the major stat lines and i pulled up the 10 highest finishers in each stat line and i took a, a list of how many of them had top 10 finishers of the event in them to see what were the most important stats at different events funny enough at for the champions cup c1 in regulation and c2 in regulation actually had higher uh, amount of top 10 finishers in them than any other event this year and strokes gained tee to green also tied for the highest amount fairways hit only middle of the road funny enough so that argument that that's the thing that won it all who knows uh, but some big cons like uh, Dustin mentioned the falling tree limbs and the, the mandatory relief danger for players and spectators never good and the weather is a major concern whenever you're out in Illinois it just comes up out of nowhere sometimes um, and causes some serious issues. Do I think it could be used going forward? I think we need to wait and see what the IDGC does with WR Jackson. But more than anything, I just hope the people who are making the, the courses out there are watching these events, taking notes, because this course was great. Yeah, it definitely produced some very interesting results. And I think there's a lot of mixed opinions out there, but I'll be serious 
curious to see what they do moving forward, especially once that new track um, that replaces WR is is in. Uh, last thing I saw is that they are currently auctioning off every single piece of sign, basket, and everything mm-hmm. related to the old three courses to try and like fund the new one. Um, I saw that the other day. You can like just go buy a next hole sign. <laughs> it's uh, mm-hmm. pretty Sick. interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty interesting. Uh, all right, so we're going to talk a little bit of FPO specifically here at this event. Uh, previously on this show, we've talked about the idea of of using easier courses to create more parity in the FPO division. Okay, fine. I was mostly the one talking about that. I admit that. Um, (laughs) At Champions Cup, we saw that a super difficult course created some parity near the top of the leaderboard. Was the solution all along to actually make the courses for FPO more difficult? Michelle, what do you think? Well, I certainly think that it depends how you make the course harder. I think that Northwood, it forces a player to nail lines and give the results to who's the best at throwing their lines. Uh, I don't think that it's strange that the FPO player who's been leading T to green wins, wins this event. Uh, I was so happy for Evelina. And you can also see like Henna coming in second. She's also been great at T to green, which you have to get at Northwood. Um, but saying that, I do think do like that the uh that making the fpo course harder is a solution i think it's normally been like only putting a shorter t pad or just like shorter holes it often makes it easier uh and i don't think that the designs in the past has been designed for fpo and i think that if you really focus on making a hard fpo course uh you get hard lines ob that makes sense uh that ups the whole difficulty. I also think that if the course is relatively easy, the best FPO players will destroy it. I mean, we've, see, we've seen Tatar do it in the past on multiple courses. Um, and I think that if you, uh, if the course put pressure on like even the best players, uh, it's going to be more inviting to have more players in the top. Uh, that being said, I don't think that tough lines or in tight wooden courses is the only way to push players. I mean, hitting lines is a skill, but also is throwing long and making good approaches and making putts. So, yeah. yeah, we we certainly saw the uh, the the you know the tee to green players you know, like you mentioned really thrive at that course just because of their ability to get around um, and stay out of trouble. Um, Dustin, what were your thoughts um, on the the FPO theory? We haven't had you in here to to tune yeah. in on that yet. I mean, first off, I'll just say Michelle nailed it. I think everything she said was perfect. Uh, I, I would reiterate that. Um, what I will say is this. It's like it's no surprise that if you make the skill ceiling of a course higher, then the higher level of players are going to be able to separate themselves more easily from the weaker players in the field First, a birdie or die easier course where weaker players are still going to have an opportunity to perhaps contend with the best because their skill set isn't being challenged as much. So I think that's just kind of an obvious thing. I think we've discussed many times that there's a common mentality that the FPO field is pushing forward. We're getting stronger athletes in the division and just overall the parity is growing amongst the talent on the course you're seeing bigger distances come from the division from several players so obviously you know michelle is talking about gap hitting and lines and that skill set but distance is getting pushed i mean we saw that with holland hanley and ella hansen we're seeing that right now with elias or middling um and you're going to continue to see that i think there's even like an amateur names like Diste on youtube shout out to her taylor chocek i think she's from uh, oregon she's a uh, she plays for oregon's like track and field team a hepathlete and she's throwing like 70 miles per hour and like can throw 500 feet she had a video with like nate sexton or something that was crazy so when you continue to get these types of athletic women from college sports backgrounds or what have you into the professional sport it's going to continue to push the skill ceiling forward as far as what is possible for these fbo players to do at the top level and yeah we have seen tatar kind of dominate the past couple of years but we've also seen everyone underneath her start growing and now this year you're having a bunch of different unique winners who can compete with tatar even when she's playing really well and she's in competition so yeah i think obviously as the field grows and gets stronger the courses have to suit it too Okay. Um, Gary, what do you think? I think the first point I have to say is that there's nothing wrong with dominance and big wins. It's fascinating to watch. And at times you need to have those things, but I also agree at some points you need to have parity. It can't happen every single weekend that there's such big separation. Second point I want to make real quick is six of the top 10 finishers were international women, which is incredible. It just shows the sports moving forward and growing in a really big way. What I think happened here is that classic concept of that the smallest distance between two points is just to bring them together. And when you have a course that's super, super difficult, like Northwoods, um, you have the best players who are prone to making the more aggressive shots, sometimes struggle a bit, and their score ends up here. You have the players on the other side who 
maybe you're playing a bit safer and they're surviving. So their scores end up here and they end up coming together because you bring the two points together. And that's kind of where you get some of this parity from. Um, and I think in time, it's going to actually have the opposite effect because as the better players review the, the film uh, and they learn how to play the course better, I think the field's going to adjust and harder courses are going to, you're going to see separation again. The interesting thing to look at here is that aside from holes 10, 12, and 14, the difficulty from MPO and FPO was wildly different. Hole 18 was the third hardest for the MPO, but it was the easiest for the FPO. 16 and 17 were the easiest for the MPO, uh, but they were some of the harder ones for the FPO, which creates the biggest argument that I think that the FPO is now ready to have their own course tailored to challenge their specific skill sets, allows designers to be more creative and challenge them in unique ways. And this also might help in the future when these weather issues come up, there's less players on the single same course. You can manage all that easier. I think tough courses are good. Solution is we need to get, you know, this figured out. Yeah, I think there's there's no doubt that the the more we consider them when designing the course, the better things are going to turn out. So Brody, I think you were the first one to kind of get on this idea. So what do you yeah. think about it? I mean, it's no shocker, Gary, that you said like 16 and 17 were tough for FPO. They played the same same exact holes as MPO, mm -hmm. where 18 FPO's T pad was the ideal landing zone for an MPO T shot. So uh, that just goes to show, like you're saying, that we really do need to have horses designed for FPO. Uh, I'll, I'll use this analogy, Dustin. You you know, don't take this offensively, but you do look like a guy that's good at chess. Am no. I correct in that? <laughs> Awful at chess. Okay, let's so let's on. assume let's assume that let's you're pretend good. I was for your argument. Let's, just, let's pretend that you're good at chess. I look right. like a guy that's probably not good at chess. So if me and you play chess, you would probably beat me every single time. Fair. Continue okay. this for the sake of your argument. Yes. Well, what if we started doing box chess? And now now we've added an, another element. Do you think you beat me every single time in that? Probably not. I probably get you maybe one out of ten, maybe two out of ten. We're adding another variable to the to the to the thing, and that is what Northwood does. Most disc golf courses, the variable of course management of should I throw a forehand or should I throw a backhand, that doesn't that doesn't exist. It's I'm going to throw the shot that's best for me. At Northwood, that's not the case. You need to throw the shot that's best for that hole. Um, there's also other times too where it's like, should I throw a roller and try to get as far up the fairway as possible, or should I just pitch out? and make sure that my next shot, I actually have a legitimate spot. I mean, we saw Ricky Wysocki, who's one of the best scramble players of all time, just have a complete meltdown on hole 14, right? Because he has kept trying to throw these crazy shots. It doesn't work out there. So I'll say yeah. that adding more at variables, you're going to get more parity. It's not just going to be who can execute. I will say the, like the, yeah, the, question on everybody's mind after just about every bad shot at Northwood is do how heroic do I try to be like it's it is you have to ask yourself that over and over and over again and when you're in the woods especially and it like try to you think about the roller shot and how many variables come into play on that because now you, know, you got to worry about terrain that might not be even and, and there's so much luck involved it's yeah it definitely you, scrambles some people out there if you played hole 12 which hole 12 and four, full 14 are the two hardest holes on the course if you played hole 12 and you walked up there and you said, I'm not trying to birdie this hole. I'm not trying to par this hole. I'm playing this hole for bogey. Most people would get a bogey on that hole almost every single time. It would eliminate the mm -hmm. sevens, the eights, the nines, the tens that we saw. I think, I think even Eagle got a 10 on that hole. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, would it would eliminate that at, 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 if you played it for bogey. But the fact that we are playing it for birdie and we are playing it for par that's when you get yourself in trouble. And that's why I love that course because you actually have to make decisions. You mm. can't just go out and just throw the shot that you're the most comfortable with. Can I ask Brody a question? Yeah, this is I'm a, not good at chess. I'm not good no, at no, chess. No, 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 this is unrelated. <laughs> Do you think oh, that, because okay. you're actually a player on the tour, you played this course and, and all that jazz. <laughs> Do you think that people having seen what just took place at this tournament and who won it and how they won it, do you think people will approach this course differently strategically going forward? I think some will and some won't. I think some people are idiots and some people are smart. Okay. <laughs> I think it's going to be tough for the guys that played pretty aggressive, but had one or two rounds that were really good paired with some bad ones. Cause they're going to think we'll just don't have the bad day versus maybe if there was a guy that didn't have anything working out there, then they might, might be a little easier for them to just swallow their pride and be like, I'm going to play very safe golf. The, the, the perfect example of this is Simon Lazat. Do we think all of a sudden he got way better at throwing the Frisbee and way better at putting? No, he just mm -hmm. changed his style of play. It look how long it took him to, to mature and get to that point. Took an injury. There are some <laughs> players. What would you say? Took an injury. 
Yeah. yeah. There are some players like Joey Buckets. Joey Buckets is a very, very young player. You look at him, he played very smart this entire tournament. Right? It didn't take him eight years of playing to be like, wait a second, what, what, what yeah. do I need to be doing differently? So that's why I think some people will get it and some people won't. So those mm-hmm. usually it's those of us who are born with not strong arms. We have to decide to be the, we, <laughs> we're like, no, we just play safe golf. Like, no, I just can't throw further than 400 feet. That's the problem. <laughs> um, all right. So we did have a pretty surprising winner. Well, to some people, some other, some other not people, to Hunter, not to Hunter. He saw it coming. He, he knew it. He so saw it coming. BS, by the to way, be fair but... though, to be fair, I haven't looked at the footage, but I think there is a chance that he may have name dropped him on the preview oh show. Oh my God. And if he did that, I you gotta That'd give be him insane. some amount Never of credit. Hear the end of it, then yeah, you have to give him some amount of credit because, like, then it's like, well, he yeah, he said it. So I don't know. Everybody has that one weird player where, like, you think of a course and you start bringing up their name. So maybe that was just Prez now for Hunter. He's he's always been a Prez for Prez guy. Um, all right, so just won the Champions Cup. It's like, what happens now? So the question here is, what does the major win do for a player like Andrew Prez now? You know, we're talking about a guy who's kind of a journeyman on tour, never had that huge win. You know, how much of an impact does it have on his career moving forward? What's going to happen now? Um, Dustin. So I'm going to be a little bit pessimistic, unfortunately. I don't mean anything personal to Prez, but this is just what it is. Like, obviously, he's going to get him of disc, and so he's probably going to get some financial gain from that. Maybe this helps them towards a path of getting back on the elite team and getting a tour series disc for 2025. I don't know exactly how they decide that for Discraft. Like, Birdie would know that a little bit better, but maybe it could help him, again, get back on that elite team train. Maybe that means more financial stuff for him next year. Like I said, a tour series disc would be one of them. Um, he could just also maybe see a part-time, like, social boost right now if he's hitting podcast he's engaging on socials his name's out there right now he can try to help use that to grow his brand his popularity a little bit or even use it to leverage a contract somewhere else if he's not going to stay within discraft but who really knows the issue is just can he continue this form because it seems like this particular course just really suited his game and it really just worked out for him I mean, outside of this, his only other like big win was a Super Series event last year at the Mid-America Open, but he had never won an elite event or a national tour or anything like that. He kind of has been in the top 25 this year. And even last year, that was kind of the case. But when you look at it, he was 30th on tour last year, 31st on tour in 2022, and 27th on tour in 2021. Like, yes, he is always going to have this moment. He's going to be say, I'm a major winner. And that, no one can ever take that away from him. But as far as building a legacy off of this, it only is going to work out that way if he kind of pulls an a b and this somehow like opens up the floodgates and he starts having a lot of success going forward with more wins or more top 10 finishes or whatever the case may be but history just doesn't seem to show that and so unfortunately this is probably just gonna be kind of a flash in the pan for him all right fair enough flash in the pan gary what are your thoughts well, first of all, I think Presnell, he's hes a grinder, man. Uh, I, I've been lucky enough to meet him out at Ledgestone a couple times, and I actually beat him in a CTP contest one of the two times that I tried, so oh. I have that going for me. Oh, yeah. um, jokes aside, though, I, I couldn't be happier for him. I think, like Dustin said, there's going to be an initial boost of like disc sales, maybe a sweet commemorative disc. Hey, let's get some more Presnell drones and forces printed up, and let's get them out there in circulation. Big boost in confidence for him. I think the biggest change for him is he's going to start bagging two putting putters with him. That's going to be a big thing. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> and uh, future impact, though, I think there's an argument to be made of getting back on the elite team because the major goes a lot in the stats. But it, Dustin and I are kind of in the same vein here. If we're being really honest, I, I don't think much is going to happen. Um, he doesn't really have the stats to be overwhelmingly competitive each weekend. Uh, he finishes well enough to be on tour and be a journeyman, like we all said, but he doesn't really have elite distance. He's not the best putter in the world. His best stat last year was 28th in fairways hit and nothing else inside the top 50. His stats look better this year, but it's still kind of early. I think, like Dustin said, it's a flash in the pan kind of moment. Uh, next year, if we're back at Northwood or wherever we're going to be at, someone's going to watch the film. They're going to figure out how to go four down or better each each round. I just... In three years, we're not going to remember this. We're going to be looking back, scrolling through all the major winners and going, oh, hey, Presnell won that. I, I forgot about that. Good for him. Yeah, good pr- good pronunciation on that Presnell, by the way. You got to make sure you get that Presnell in there. Um, commentary team was really good, really good at that one. <laughs> um, Brody, what do you think? What's the future look like for the Prez? Yeah, I'm pretty happy I'm, I'm going third here because uh, you guys can get the the brunt of the comments of all the softies out there that if you say anything like critical about a player, you're, you're a, you're a terrible person. So uh, I'm glad I'm not going first. Cause I would have gotten everything. Cause what you guys all said is, is accurate. And if you think it's anything more, anything different than that, then you're living on la la land. We've seen this before from other players as well. Um, one of them would be like Parker Welk who had that 
head to head battle, which was an epic, like Prez kind of just coasted. Like he played really well at the end to where he kind of just coasted into that win. It wasn't really a back and forth of where we were thinking like, Oh my God, is he going to crack under press pressure? To be fair, he did make some big putts that I did not think he was going to make a uh, whole fifth. Uh, who was it? Whole 14 or 15. He made that big putt. Wasn't expecting that to go in. De- definitely didn't expect whole 16s putt to go in, even though it was that little, you know, Bambi deer feet or whatever he had after he made that putt. Um, but he threw some really good shots. So I-, I think it's, I think it's in that same situation. Now, as far as will he make it on the elite team? This one win, there's a whole algorithm that goes into it with all okay. these different things. This one win obviously is going to be better for him uh, to boost him up than if he didn't win this. But just winning a major doesn't automatically get you on there. Um, there are people like myself right now that's probably well off the elite team next year. So there's a lot of spots that can be can be taken. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like he really needs to capitalize on this in the next couple of events. That's what I would say to keep the momentum going as Hunter would love to tell you. Yeah. So we got a, we got a consensus so far, Michelle, are you in agreement? Yeah. Lucky number four. (laughs) I agree with everyone else. Uh, I think that you can see the impact on the career in two different ways, Uh, the short term. And I think that he will feel he will feel an impact short term. He will have more eyes on him. He will be talked about. He will be on feature cards, sell discs, whatever. Like, but uh, I mean, if it's going to give him a more long long term impact, it depends solely on his com- uh, coming performances. Like you all said, uh, I think right now there are so many different winners that uh, at the end of the season we can be like, ooh. Did he win that? Because <laughs> we can't forget it based on what's happening. Uh, or maybe he's winning more DGPT events. And I mean, if he gets in the top uh, in more competitions, then yeah, he will keep riding this wave. But uh, for him as a player, uh, of course, this means a lot. Uh, it means that he can win a major. He can win DGPT events. Uh, it means uh, a big ch- paycheck that, uh, well, he hasn't been in the top that much, so he, he probably needs it. Uh, the attention, the confidence boost, everything. Uh, well, we'll, have to, we'll just have to see. I mean, the win gives him a huge ground to build on, uh, but uh, to continue to build, he has to continue to win. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, uh, it, the next uh, few events, there'll be a little bit of a microscope because of that kind of like boost you get from a major win like this. I think a, a good example is like, like Parker Welk is a good example. Even Corey Ellis winning Corey the major. Ellis, yep. And you know, he's a, I would, I would say he's a bit of a better player, a little more of a threat. He's been in contention more often than Prez now. Mm-hmm. But I think because of the difficulty of this course, how much different it was really not even the difficulty it's just how different it was. And the fact that it was the first time we had played this many rounds there. So players just didn't like, it was the perfect storm for somebody to just win out of nowhere like this. And, and that's what we got. But, you never know. Maybe yeah. sometimes you, once you win one, you kind of realize you know the recipe, and then who knows? Maybe you can translate it. We'll to see. Yeah. To to add on to that, like if he ends up winning again, or if he ends up getting in contention to win again in the next month or two, that is going to have a bigger impact than if someone else at his kind of level of play does the same thing, right? So like that's where he has that momentum of people that are thinking about him, major champion. Yeah. And like Isaac Robinson, for example, not having a great season doesn't really matter that much, though, because he capitalized it on last year, right? Winning a major and then winning another one to where that second one kind of submitted him of like, holy cow, this guy just won two in one year. You know, what's the funny thing about majors is when somebody who is one of our top players who wins often wins a major, it it feels very big because it's a huge legacy builder for them, right? If Calvin right now were to win a major, humongous for him, it's a legacy builder. But when a kind of a random player who hasn't even won before, like a Presnell wins a major, it's kind of just feels like, you know, every other one, like, yes, he will now end his career with a major. And that's a thing, but because the majors only really get brought up in the, in the discussions of who versus they, you know, it's like, this person versus that person. Well, they had this many majors. And so, yes, he's not going to be on the the list of guys who never won a major, but how often 15 years from now, when his career is over, are we going to be talking about Presnell anyways? That's definitely a thing. So I feel like he might be Brooks Kepka. He might just be an absolute champions cup monster. Also, yeah, 
That's yeah. like the only tournament he wins. He just wins four champions. Well, champions then you have then career. you have like uh, Isaac Robinson. Like maybe Isaac Robinson just ends up like only winning. Yeah, like just majors. Like he's just not gonna win the normal yeah. pro tours. He it's, just wins yeah. majors. All yeah. the yeah. tournaments are beneath him. It'd be pretty sick if Presnell, if they kept it here and Presnell just kept winning this event and He's had like, like five seven of them. Yeah. Mm. And then he has no other wins, but like everybody <laughs> yeah. knows when you go to Northwood, like that's Presnell's house. Yeah. <laughs> just rename uh. whole 12 the pretzel. I, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I'll be curious to see how he does at Ledgestone because just kind of carrying over some of that momentum. It'll be yeah. a, a big one. I think a lot of people have eyes on, on him for that event. It's, yeah, it's just like... When you when you can play Ledgestone and only have to play there twice, and like at that point you just need to shoot one hot round and one just survive round, and that's good enough. It's just so different. Like four mm -hmm. rounds in that in those woods are like it's a very different ball game. So all right, we're gonna move on to our next topic. This one should be pretty interesting. This is a fan submitted topic. I mean, we may have talked about this a long time ago on the show, but I don't I'm not really sure if I remember. Um so we're going to talk about Mount Rushmore's of disc golf. And I know Michelle's from Sweden, so I had to make sure. Michelle, are you familiar with the sports Mount Rushmore argument? Um, uh, no. It's okay. So no one goes to Mount Rushmore there's a, anyways. There's a reason why I phrased it like the top four after in the, in the question because I knew well, Michelle. I know what the Mount Rushmore is. Well, yeah, yeah, but no, no. But like, like compared to sports. Right. So like, and often, and so that's why I phrased it as like, top four so that you, you it would help you out. Cause I didn't want to like, I didn't want to just like throw the American culture on you, but so Who's the statue yeah. of Liberty of this Ex ex exactly. So <laughs> in, in sports, we often talk about our Mount Rushmore as like, since we put four, you know, famous American uh, characters on this mountain, not characters, but in, in <laughs> historical <laughs> figures on this uh, mountain, we talk about in sports often, like who's your Mount Rushmore of basketball, baseball, hockey, whatever this and that. So I want to know if you were to create a Mount Rushmore of disc golf who is on it so I'm talking about top four of any criteria you feel makes sense it doesn't have to be just the best four players this could be some that are good some that were really influential um, there's a lot of ways you could take this I'm curious to see because I don't think that I think most people would have different answers for this I'm curious to see if people's overlap or what we come up with here so Gary yeah, I'm scared Let's hear it. Who is your Mount Rushmore? I know somebody's going to feel like they have a unique one and somebody else is going to have the exact same thing. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Gary, who's on your Mount Rushmore? I, I did not want to go first because I went really abstract on this one because uh, you left it open-ended. Um, uh, before I do anything, my personal favorite player Mount Rushmore is always going to be Nate Sexton, Greg Barsby, Brian Earhart, and Matteo, what I would give to play on a card with those guys. Um, okay. But like I said, I'm going in a completely different direction. I'm looking uh -huh. at impact on the game. Spot one impact in the game goes to charitable organizations. Look at Paul Macbeth Foundation, Edge Disc Golf, Saki Bomb Foundation, <laughs> You Play, Throw Pig, Ledgestone raising money for St. Jude. You're, you're thumbing down Ledgestone raising money for St. Jude right now. Find out your answer. <laughs> I'm laying out your answer. answer. Very little is as important as the work being done by those guys. Second spot on the Mount Rushmore goes to the Holy Shot because it made live oh, disc geez. golf feel incredibly necessary. Uh, it brought so many eyes to the sport, the impact that it had on MVP and the ripple effect to Simon and Eagle. We all remember where we were at when the holy shot happened. I was on the couch screaming. My wife thought I was dying. Uh, spot three <laughs> goes to the COVID germ. All right. <laughs> COVID was <laughs> terrible for so many people. And I don't want to miss that point. <laughs> Please give him more time. Please give him more but, time because we're ruining it. it. But but it, it brought so many people into the sport like never before, and it created an unofficial era. Are you a pre-COVID player or are you a post-COVID player? Spot four on my Mount Rushmore in all seriousness goes to the local TDs, the club boards, and the league runners that are out there because the future of the sport, the future champion, is out there somewhere this week playing for a tag. He or she are putting it down. And these men and women running these things, this is where the sport foundation is built on. We don't talk about them enough. And I just wanted to give him a, a shout out Listen, here on the, on the Rushmore. I respect, I, I, I respect the uniqueness of your answer. I do respect it. You did just put COVID on Mount Rushmore, the COVID germ <laughs> on Mount Rushmore. <laughs> I would, that got me. That unfortunately, was the one that killed me. Unfortunately, Gary, Mount Rushmore has to have faces, and none of well, those things have faces. It's just the COVID yeah. germ, so, you know. You you could put the point. local TDs. Local TDs. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot That's of right. them on there. It's, it's a, a lot of them. I respect sure the, the sacrifice that Gary, Gary the, to not yeah. overlap yeah. names with other people. The metaphorical the Mount Rushmore. Shot. You didn't pick James Conrad, the person that made the holy shot. Yes, but it was the atmosphere, right? We couldn't have had the holy shot without the creation of the course. But also, the fact that it was James Conrad, I think, was the perfect person to do it well then put oh, them on yours yeah. then bro you won't no i'm gonna right. i'm gonna right. I, you're up 
guys, Batter I'm up, up here. I support number Gary, one. Number gone. one is the PDGA. Uh, <laughs> number two is uh, Terry Miller. Mm. Number three. Sorry, I had the Gary hat there for a second on my head. Um, <laughs> let's see. No, I, I'm, I'm going to go like the old fashioned way. I think you go. I think you go like King Climo. I think you go Paul Macbeth. I think you go Kristen Tatar. I'm going to go AB as like a future pick. Whoa. Ooh. Interesting. Uh, not, not there yet, but like a futuristic pick that he will be one of the players that brings in the athletes. Uh, because I think if you look at each one of those people, I think each one of them had some sort of influence on, like I think Kristen Tatar has brought a huge influence on not just international women coming over and playing but also like younger women like taking it more seriously training practicing i think that has a huge impact on the fpo field getting better obviously i think paul and ken have done basically the same thing just different eras of time and then i think ab will actually bring in a new breed of disc golfer and uh that will elevate because that's the one thing that we are kind of missing right now is like actual athletes getting into disc golf well, I love AB as much as the next guy, but putting him on Mount Rushmore is psycho. Just gonna futuristic. Put that out there. Almost just gonna put that out there. That's almost that's as good as the year, Fifteen years from now, tell me how psycho. Unfortunately, we are not fifteen years from now. <laughs> how long do you think it took him to make Mount Rushmore? <laughs> Let me look that up. Ooh. Let me look that I don't up know. I don't know. Ooh. Michelle, it is now mm. your turn. See if you can do better. <laughs> Jeez, at least I AB is better than COVID, okay? <laughs> yes. Uh, no. 14 years! <laughs> That's a freaking no! Okay, Brody, shut 14 up. 14 years! <laughs> oh, give her a point for that! <laughs> Sorry. For me... I will. For me. Guys, like, for me, just end the discussion about who's the GOAT. Just put, like, our two GOATs smiling next to each other. Ken Climo, Paul Macbeth. Yeah. Uh, and... Obviously, next, I'm going for like one of the greatest players that I've been in this golf. Someone who's made a great impact, uh, like who's inspired a lot of people, who's dominated. Uh, and if you look at FPO, uh, to me, that's simple. Uh, the six time world champion and the name that I had on my first ever putter, Juliana Corver. Okay. Um, and then we cannot have another All American Mount Rushmore. So I'm saying the same <laughs> as Brody. Put Tatar up there. Um, she's played amazing disc golf. She's dominated. Uh, she's professional. Like her grace on and off the course, uh, and the fact that she's an inspiration. So, my Mount Rushmore, simple. Okay, Michelle, pretty, not even from the U.S. Mind, best Michelle. Mount Rushmore mm -hmm. yet. Um, here's the thing: Corver is actually a great pick because a lot of people mm -hmm. don't realize Rookie like how year. big. How yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't realize how big she was for the for the women's game. I mean, there was a time where she was going out and playing a lot of men's tournaments and winning. Like Juliana Corver mm -hmm. was was legit. Um, all right, Dustin, has anybody taken your Mount Rushmore? No, mine's I did. so mine's so boring, unfortunately. <laughs> but here okay. we go. Here we go. He's so boring right now. For, I kind of try to do a collection of historical figures that had impact on the sport and like players. So I kind of <laughs> did like a little mixture of one. Okay. So the first one's gonna be Steady Ed Hedrick. I think he's, he's the father go. of a modern day frisbee and modern day disc golf, created the first disc golf target, formed the DGA, the first <laughs> disc golf company, obviously formed the PDGA. You know all the deals. Steady Ed kind of started disc golf. He wasn't the only pioneer. There were others who helped him. He's not alone, but he's kind of the face of it, right? Then I want to put Dave Dunapis as number two that's because mm. he obviously founded innova mm -hmm. which is still to this day the biggest company and disc golf for the most part besides this craft being a close rival also invented the first beveled edge disc which brought you know disc into the modern era of disc shape that we use in actual competition with the eagle also yeah. a super successful company that's just inspired others to start disc golf manufacturing and i think his rivalry with jim kenner at disc craft was massive for the development of the sport then i want to put kim climo on there because he is kind of the first real goat of disc golf uh, he wasn't the first world champion, but he won nine in a row from 1994 and became one of the guys who had his name on a disc, had his own type of plastic blend. You know, he really did seem to be kind of the front runner of 
what we see today with people getting commemorative disc and, and things of that nature, and obviously just being one of the best. And then I'm going to put Paul McBeth at the end because he's kind of the more modern era goat. He pushed, you know, having lines of discs for players. He pushed the a million dollar contract thing. Obviously, the foundation that he created helps spread disc golf around the world. So the charitable end. So he did a lot. And then honorable mention right here at the end. I couldn't think of one FPO name. No, that no honorable most- mentions. Okay. 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 No honorable mentions. You okay. can't sneak. You had no women on yours. You okay. cannot sneak it in. Mm. Okay. No mm. women. <laughs> yeah. You just decided to pick two people that create no. a business. Well, Cook no. him, Brody. Cook to him. be fair, Ed, I, I was waiting <laughs> to hear heck? Ed on somebody's because the man did invent the sport. That's totally fair. And mm. Dave, no one puts James Naismith as the as, as on Mount Rushmore in basketball. He right. right. Well, he to right. be fair, well, <laughs> no one does that. Well, nobody puts COVID on anything either. And you know, that's, this is, that's cr- I never Brody. said that's. Uh, Anybody else? Somebody puts in Mount Rushmore basketball. Anthony Edwards, like mm. basically the same thing you just did with AB. So, hush. Yeah. It took 14 years to make Mount Rushmore. It's called <laughs> putting. Well, we want to put someone on there, and then 14 years from now, I'll be like, oh wow, be we don't clear, even have my the Mount Rushmore. Player. The best player in the world ever is nine on Mount Rushmore. That's kind of bad. My disc golf Mount Rushmore would be Steady Ed, Paul McBeth, Ken Climo, and the FPO player is tough because I. There's if you six candidates that all are like Paige so good Pierce, for it. If she wouldn't have fallen off so hard as of yeah. late, would have probably been my Ooh. pick. Yeah. Um, yeah. Retired. But Corver's a tough one too, though. But then, yeah, like- and then like if you give it another like five years, it's probably gonna be pretty unanimously Kristen. Like would be a would probably make sense. So depends on how many more worlds she gets. Guys, yeah. She yeah. had she had a news crew at the airport when she got off her plane. Yeah. Well, what? I mean, that's a country <laughs> thing, not an FPO thing. I feel like. yeah, almost I mean, as that's... impressive as charitable donations to St. Jude. Well, she lives in Estonia. <laughs> <laughs> so I know I'm just thumbing down that. I'm just I'm that. that. <laughs> oh yeah, that that was cha- charities is a terrible thing to put up on this Mount man's Rushmore. A terrible. Charity. <laughs> how, hey, 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 how do you sculpt you? charities? Wait, I'm sorry. What? What? Real quick. What I really the, need to make a question. Any criteria that you feel makes sense. You thought it made sense. No, I listen. Barry's I, is right. the one I want to see sculpted the most. I want to see someone do an AI re- <laughs> I, representation. Yeah, so much so if anybody can do these, like I want you to make each of our Mount Rushmores, especially yes. Gary's. <laughs> Figure that Build one mine out. upon a body built with freedom, crushing all. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Figure that one out. Um, all right. We are going to move on to our finals. Close one today. Dustin and Gary are moving on, tied up. Um, Gary has kind of been. Uh, Kind of been a baller this season. He's got a bunch of wins. So I'm going to give Gary the nod here. Do you want to go first or second? You know what? I, I am so excited to be on this with Dustin. I got to let him go first. I just want to admire okay. his answer. Okay. So this is a question that oh, no. what's funny is. <laughs> <laughs> I this didn't guy... think I was going to get this far. So this is unfortunate. But let's go ahead. <laughs> no, it's okay. You got this. I actually brought this question up. Hunter and I were talking and we kind of mentioned it. And then we kind of were like. Huh, that is kind of an interesting question. And then I was like, nope, let's stop talking about it right now. I'm going to put it on debate night because I didn't know if he was going to be on or not. So there are two players striving for the all-time majors record, or at least they're closest, I should say. Paige Pierce and Paul McBeth both currently have 17 and need two more to hold the record by themselves at 19. Climo has 18 as who they are chasing. Which of these two players is the most likely to do so and why? Dustin. Yeah, so this one's tough because just forget like how close they are to the major record. It's that they're both in such similar positions. Like they're already considered GOAT candidates for their respective divisions. Both have massive legacies. Both have already made their money. Both are already 33 years old. Both are maybe hitting the final stretches of their careers before they go to age the divisions or go do something else with their lives. Obviously, some are out of world titles, all that stuff, right? Both of them also won their last major in 2022. So they both have like the same exact recency as far as how far away they are from their last major. Both of them are coming off of injury, although I think it's fair to state that Pages was a lot more severe and a lot harder to come back from than perhaps what Paul McBeth is dealing with. So I think that that is kind of a one thing that you have to kind of consider in all this. Um, Also, let's face it, Paige so far since coming back has not looked like she's close to a major at all. Uh, her best finish was 10th at chess.com, but she was nearly 20 strokes off the lead. That's the closest she's been to a lead this year, by the way, 20 strokes uh, or maybe 19 strokes. So it's like right around that. So not really looking good for her. Like if we're looking at a recent C time window, Paul, on the other hand, was in the mix to win MCO at second place. It was at least in contention for a time at champions cup. After the first couple of rounds, he was in the top 10 using striking distance, but obviously he kind of petered off after that. Um, but the issue is, is that he looked really poor at uh, MCO to kick off the season. So I can't really tell if he's coming back into form or not um again the last couple events have looked good but i'm just not really sure where he's really at um here's the thing 
to kind of finally separate it, because we've been doing a lot of like similarities, I do think that Paul McBeth has another major in him due to the killer instinct mentality that he has. You know, I think sometimes Paige Pierce has at times sounded like she still has a killer instinct, sounded like she still really wants to win, sounded like she was still really hungry. But there's been other times where it seems like she is kind of content where she is and she's happy and she just wants to kind of continue that. Whereas Paul, he has everything he needs already right now. And the only thing driving him, I think, is that chase for that next major to be the GOAT. And I feel like he still has that mentality to go out and do it and has proven he's still got the skills to go out and do it. So I'm going to pick Paul McBeth in the end. Okay, Dustin going with Paul. Gary, do you concur? Yeah, I mean, arguably, like we said, the two of the most dominant players to ever play the game, arguably Mount Rushmore worthy. Um, the history for both of them is just incredible. Uh, Dustin called it out. A lot of similarities. You know, Paige started in 2011 with her first major. Paul started in 2012. Both of them didn't win a major in 2016. Don't know what was going on that year. Um, and both of the last major wins was in 2022. And neither of them have ever seen a more than two season drought in, in major wins. History shows that they've been virtually the same, but the present shows that they are not the same anymore. Um, more on that in a moment. But the argument, I think, can be looked at in two different ways. Who has the better field to win in and who has the skills needed to win? If you The field argument, I think, goes to Paige because the, the FBO field is never all firing at the same time all at once. So I think there's a chance that she could sneak in a gap between people's off weeks. The MPO field, on the other hand, is becoming increasingly more difficult to win in, and it's not slowing down anytime soon. The better skill set argument, though, definitely goes in Paul's favor because he still, like Dustin said, has the mindset, the killer mentality, and the talent, I think, to go down and take down an event. He just needs to put it together for four rounds and do it. Um, Paige's skill set is looking terrible right now, I'm sorry to say. Um, and her mindset seems to be even worse, saying things like, I've lost my passion, and she doesn't mean her disc. Um, honestly, though... I don't think either one of them is going to do it. Uh, if I had to pick one, if you're forcing me, I think it's going to be Paul. I could see him winning one more, maybe. But I think the likely story is that they're both done for major wins. It's sad to say, but I think that's kind of where we're at. As always, I hope that I'm wrong. I hope they keep pushing the envelope and making players better. And, you know, the argument that we've had over the past few weeks of like the old guard versus the new players, I think Paul is capable of bringing it back because he's just hungry. That's all he wants. It's all he has. But eventually, it's going to go away. And I don't think it's going to be enough to get two more majors. Mm, okay. So both of you kind of locked in on Paul. I think both made good points there. I would say, um, you know, I, I agree with with pretty much everything said. I, I I'm not sure, honestly, when I asked this question, I wasn't really sure who which player I thought of either. Um, hmm, this is a tough one. This is a tough one. We go team Gary or team Dustin. Team Gary or team Dustin. I think I'm going to give it to Gary. I think I'm going to give it to mm -hmm. Gary only because I really liked your point on the strength of field. I think that was one thing that Dustin didn't quite mention that I would have. Um, very close one, though. Very close one. Uh, congratulations, Gary. You have beaten one of the giants of this show for now. He looks like he's already sought on revenge, or maybe he might just hack into my computer. I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> quickly, Brody, Michelle, I want to ask you two, what do you think on that one? Do you think well, Paige or Paul? Man of the people, guys, do not put in the comments that Trevor is a sexist or an ageist. Uh, me and Michelle have never made it to the finals, so do not put that. Well, that's not true. You've been to the <laughs> do finals. Do not put that in the comments, okay? Do not put that in the comments. So okay, answer so my question. <laughs> yeah, I can go. I was thinking about one thing, and because uh, I've always thought that, like, Paul, he has more wins in him, but he also has seven more years on his contract. Mm, but, will he really just win one major in seven years more? I not think that point. he uh, mm. absolutely, possibly can win well, two majors. I mean, going off of what Trevor and Hunter said the other day and whatever uh, that Sam guy was spitting, seven years from now, Paul's not going to be able to throw a disc five feet. <laughs> so bad. I, I, did, I did say that, yeah. Every year, he's just going to keep getting so bad. Yep. Yeah, or so everyone he, else is going to get really injured based on throwing so hard by then, by then his son's going to be winning world championships and then he gets them by default that's how it works Spoiler, you don't get injured by throwing hard <laughs> i'm gonna mute all of you guys depends how many of them you do anyways you get, you get I, yeah, I think i think it's interesting cool listen the only reason i think to be like team page on that side of the argument is because and she's made it really difficult in the past few months to take this take yeah. 
But I, I think if you would have gone back a few months, maybe you could say, well, like the FPO field can just be so wide open right. sometimes. That all it takes is like over the next few years for just two random events. Or yeah, I think she missed her window on that. I think the FPO feels too strong now for her to slip in yeah. like that. Can we can we just say the obvious here? What? Go on. The the reason why her and Kat were winning were, were that they were the only ones that were throwing far and they were playing on courses that weren't for FPO players. Now mm -hmm. that they're playing on courses that aren't uh, just for distance and also now that you have a bunch of girls that throw just as far as them. I mean that's the that's the obvious thing here. What's going on, guys? They, also got the Paul you also got the Paul Macbeth hits an extra gear for majors. Even last year he was struggling. Mm -hmm. Page and Cat were also just there, so. winning like last season and the season before though. So like that's not, where not, not, not where what I mean it, right, not they, where it used to they, be. Where it's something down a, to a new low though. I was gonna say like in 2020 or 2021 when you guys were doing grip locked, like your top three was literally P Paul Page. Cat, and then you throw a random person yeah. in there. Now it's Kristen mm -hmm. Missione every time. Yeah. <laughs> Paul's not yeah. taking weekends off you to go do a You have to throw in there, though, too, now. Yeah. Good, point. Good point, Gary. Um, yeah, no. It, I didn't it, hear it, what Gary said. What did you say, Gary? I said Paul's not taking weekends off to go to concerts. <laughs> he said that. Gary said that. Um, all right. Scary. Well, great episode, Gary. Gary Anti-Page? Gary, uh, yeah, Gary. Oh, no, 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 I actually believe it or not, I helped push Paige Pierce's van out of a ditch with Terry Miller, my boy Eric Springer, <laughs> at Ledgestone a number of years ago. So, no, oh. I was there, which she needed it most. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Gary, anything else to say in the wake of your victory? Listen, uh, Hunter and Trevor have trapped me in this room. I'm wearing the same shirt every week because they only <laughs> wheel me out for debate night. And if I All win, right. I get food. So, please That's send help. Um, no, I'm just kidding. It was great. It was great being here again. And um, just just love talking about disc golf. That's what's where it's at. I oh, mean, no more from Gary. Can't hear you can't give away any more of our secrets. Um, hey, if Connor you want to on my Mount Rushmore, if you yeah, check out the Connor Horse shirt. Awesome. Um, if you want to uh, submit topics for next week's uh, debate night, the Mount Rushmore one came from that this time. I'll unmute Gary. I can't do that. Um, <laughs> the, the, the Mount Rushmore one came from that. You can scan the QR code that's going to come up on the screen here. And you can also click the link in the description. Uh, I always look at the topics. Some of them are awesome. Some of them not as awesome, but I appreciate every single one of them. And um, I would love to. Yeah, there you go. I would, I would love for more and more submissions. Thanks again for watching this episode of Debate Night. Be nice and respectful to our analysts in the uh, comment section because they oh, do. Fire away. They fire take time out of their fire. day. <laughs> they take time out of their day to come on the show and talk disc golf for the people. So Brody's, Brody's right. Let us have it. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Everybody, go, go after Gary. <laughs> Put down in the comments below why you think Gary is the worst. No, don't yep. actually do Bring that. He likes COVID. Bring it on. Bring it on. Hate charity. Mm, yeah. Why, yeah. True. I know. <laughs> Also, I want to hear your Mount Rushmore's in the comments below. I want to hear because, like, we all have different ones. So I didn't really expect that. I want to hear everybody's Casey below. Penny, Don't forget St. Jude. Yeah, that's true. All right. All right. Enough of that. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.